If you've been taking exams all your life, you probably think you have this revision thing pretty much sorted already. After all these years, you've internalized all the techniques in the book. You have a study plan, you have the perfect memorization technique, you know not to cheat. You know exactly what you need to do to get the top grades. However, in this video, I'm going to tell you to throw all that information out of the window. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Gareth, and on this channel we discuss the tools and techniques that help law students to navigate their law degrees. Now, today I want to be talk about the various myths that are involved with studying and revision, especially if you're a law student. And in particular, I want to talk about three things which law students typically get wrong. They think that they need a study plan, they think that they need to memorise the law, and they also think that they can't cheat. And I'm going to tell you that all of that is complete BS. Most people begin their revision by carefully crafting a beautiful looking revision or study plan. They will block out their days with designated study sessions in the hope that they will know everything come exam time. For example, between 9am and 10am they will study land law, and then between 10am and 11am they will study commercial law, and so on throughout the day. At first glance, this doesn't seem like such a bad idea. After all, you're giving each topic or each module a specific and equal share of your attention. So if you studied four modules for your exams in the summer, you could split up your revision table such that you're spending 25% of your time on each of those particular modules. And as Benjamin Franklin once said, if you fail to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And so by setting out a beautiful looking revision schedule, you would think that you're mitigating any potential chance of you failing and falling when it comes to the exam. But the truth is, a study plan simply doesn't work. The main reason for this is that it forces you to predict where you're going to struggle in the future. For example, if I was studying commercial law and family law, and let's say I found commercial law significantly harder than family law, it wouldn't make much sense for me to be spending 50% of my time on each of those modules. Instead, I should be spending a lot more of my time, let's say 70 or 80% of my time, focusing on that more difficult commercial law module. So if you set yourself a, a timetable or a re revision plan, you're essentially forcing yourself to stick to these predetermined time segments where you're not actually allowing flexibility into the routine depending on whether you're struggling on a particular topic or not. So my advice is to not worry about a set timetable, but introduce something I call an ex post facto timetable, which is slightly different. An ex post facto timetable is a study timetable that doesn't look forward to what you need to do, but rather backwards to what you've already done. This involves writing down all the individual topics you need to learn, then as you revise each of them in any order you see fit, you make a mark signifying your relative comprehension. For example, when I studied commercial law, I would make a note of each of the topics, for example, actus reus, theft, assault and battery. And as I revised each topic, I would use a traffic light system to determine how easy or hard it was for me to recall each of the topics. If I found the topic difficult, I would mark it red. If I found it easy, I'd mark it green. And if my comprehension was somewhere in between, I would mark it orange. Ultimately, this provided me with a system where I could very quickly and easily visualize what I already knew and what I needed to know a bit better. So if I went to my ex post facto timetable and saw that a topic was highlighted in red, I knew I had to go back and study that again. Go back to the fundamentals and work through it until I had a good comprehensive understanding of that topic. But if the topic was green, I knew I could stay away from it from a bit. I don't have to keep going back to that topic because I've already internalized it. I already know it quite well. So this sort of mitigates the problem that is involved with a standard timetable where you will end up going over and over topics you already know. The key point is that memorization and remembering are two entirely different things. When it comes to memorization, I see it as a process of just forcing information into your head and hoping that it sticks. Whereas remembering is a bit more subtle in that you're focusing on trying to understand the fundamentals and through that understanding, you're building up a long-term entrenched knowledge of that particular topic. So whereas memorization is very much focused on the short term, remembering is very much focused on the long term. And this is a key distinction that you need to know if you want to do well as a law student. So how do we actually remember information? 
Now, an interesting concept that's worked really well for me in recent years is a concept known as rubber ducking. Put simply, rubber ducking involves explaining difficult topics to a rubber duck or some other chosen inanimate object of your choice. And if you struggle to explain it coherently, then you quickly identify those areas where you need to solidify your understanding of the fundamentals. For example, if you were trying to explain the concept of murder to your rubber duck, then it may go something like this. The actus reus of murder is the unlawful killing of another person in the Queen's peace. The mens rea of murder is an intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. The meaning of intention is, um, I think the meaning is that intention is given its ordinary meaning, but I'm not really too sure how I know that. From this, I know that I should be doing a little bit more reading on intention because I haven't really understood exactly how the definition or meaning of intention has come about. So I need to look at the textbooks, define intention and find the supporting statutory or case law for intention when it comes to murder. Now, by simply explaining different concepts and difficult legal topics to a rubber duck or some other inanimate object, you're very quickly and efficiently identifying the areas that need a bit more work. By verbalising what you're trying to say, you find the, the hiccups along the way, you find those points where you struggle to coherently understand and explain something, and that way you can pinpoint what you should be revising. It's very easy as a law student to think, I think I know this, you know, I understand the topic of murder, I understand intention, but until you try and actually teach it and verbalise it, you're never actually going to be able to pinpoint the exact problem. So explain it to a rubber duck and very quickly you can see what exactly you should be looking at and revising. And when it comes to remembering a topic, the reason why rubber ducking works so well is that it forces you to focus your knowledge on the foundations before you start branching out and learning all the extra pieces of information that support that foundation knowledge. So, for example, if you're learning about intention, it forces you to focus on the actus reus, the mens rea, and intention, all these core principles and these core points around the topic of murder before you start worrying about the individual cases and the individual um, exceptions to the law, etc. etc. So by using the rubber ducking technique, you're building up that solid core foundation, which is the very essence of remembering something. If there's one thing drilled into all students from day one, it's that you must never ever cheat. We're told horror stories about all the nasty things that will happen to us if we bring our mobile phones into the exam hall or plagiarize something we read online. Even the word cheating stirs up some visceral fear of its potential consequences. But perhaps surprisingly, cheating isn't always bad. So let me introduce you to something that I call ethical cheating. Ethical cheating involves finding out what's going to be in your exam without actually doing anything that's against the rules. And typically this would involve three different things. First of all, it would be topic selection. Second, careful listening. And thirdly, adopting the marker's mindset. First, topic selection encourages you not to learn every single topic. Unless you have an abnormal ability to recall a vast amount of information, you're going to struggle to learn everything. Now, a lot of people will tell you this is a terrible idea, but let's think about this logically. Let's say that we have to answer three essay questions in our exam from a total of five topics, and throughout the year, we've learned a total of seven topics. If this is the case, we can probably get away with not learning one or two of our least favorite topics. There's no point spending our time learning two topics that are just going to drain our energy and we're just going to forget anyway. And so let's say we're given our exam paper. The worst case scenario is that the two topics that we didn't study during our revision period actually come up in the exam itself. So we're then forced to answer those three questions that are remaining. Now, the bad point is that you don't have a choice of the questions that you actually get to answer. But the good point is that you've actually been able to study those three particular topics in a lot more depth. Now, on the flip side, if let's say the five topics you did study all come up, then not only have you got choice in terms of what you answer, but you also know those five topics much, much better than those individuals that try to learn every single topic. Secondly, your lecturers are going to drop heavy hints about what's going to be in the exam in the lectures and seminars themselves. So it's very important that you listen carefully. 
Now, one example I remember very well went as follows. A student in one of my lectures at university asked the lecturer about how they should tackle a particular question in an exam. The lecturer's response was that they didn't set that question so they don't know the answer and that the student should ask the responsible lecturer. Many of the other law students would have heard this same information and just let it slip straight over their head. But I interpreted the conversation as this question's in the exam, but I can't actually tell you any more information about this particular question. So inadvertently, the lecturer had essentially told me that this topic, this question, was going to be in the exam. So I spent a bit more time focusing on that, hedging my bets, hoping that this was going to be something that would be covered. And fortunately, it did come up, and so I did very, very well when it came to the exam itself. Lastly, try to find out who is going to be marking your exam. Now, this may not always be possible, but if you do find out this information, it's a very good way of scoring a lot of marks. So, for instance, if I was going to be doing a land law essay or a land law exam coming up in the future, I would try to find out who the particular marker is for that exam or essay, and in the essay or the exam itself, I'll try to reflect the way that they speak and the way that they write. So I'll look at their writing style, I'll look at the way that they structure their particular essays and articles, and also look at the sort of questions and topics that interest them most. And if I can weave that narrative into my own essays and my own exams, then I'm setting myself up for a potentially first class grade. Revising for exams isn't simply a matter of picking up a textbook and cramming that information into your head, hoping that it's going to stick. You can't just use the same tools and techniques that every other student has been using. You know, you hear about every student using this particular process, picking up a textbook, writing notes, underlining, just because it may work for someone else doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work for you. The point of this video is to demystify some of the different study techniques that other students are using and to debunk some of the myths surrounding effective study and revision. And I want you to go away from this video and have a think about what sort of techniques and tools you're currently using when it comes to revising for exams and to try and avoid taking the same route as everyone else. Find what works for you and you're going to do really well in your own exams. If you found this video interesting, then you're also probably going to enjoy my masterclass in studying as a first class law student. So do check that out if you want to. Anyway, I hope you found this video useful and if you enjoyed the video, then make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>